Uh, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about Squadron Strike Formations, or who the heck is in charge? Now, first of all, why do you worry about formations? Well, number one thing is to help mitigate abuse of the point system. Squadron Strike point system, you know, built by the spreadsheet from Hades, um, can only do so much in terms of making a balanced game. You can have one side field, no, well, four rather standard ships, and the other side field, 40 small two-point ships. Guess who will win? The two-point ships, because the bigger ships will just not be able to kill them fast enough. So it limits the number of ships per side, which helps make more even, balanced, and thus fun games to play. It also helps determine the number of players you need per side. Uh, the sweet spot for Squadron Strike is about four ships per player. And coincidentally, uh, most squadrons will max out at four ships. So, if you have uh, one player per squadron, you can pretty much calculate how many players you need. Now, some terms. Now, first we have the term fleet. You hear this a lot, fleet, fleet, fleet. Now, fleet just refers to the ships participating in a particular scenario or battle. Don't confuse the term fleet used in formations with the campaign fleet which can be composed of you know, multiple scenario fleets and squadrons or however your campaign system wants to organize things at the macro level. We'd say fleet, we're referring specifically to the ships participating in a scenario. Now, fleet is made up of one to five squadrons. And a squadron is a collection of one to four ships. Within that squadron, you have the squadron leader. That's the one ship that's in command of the squadron. Its sole special ability is to lend action points to any ship within its squadron. Now the flagship squadron is a squadron that's in charge of the entire fleet. It has one to three ships in it. And the only special ability of the flagship is that it can command the entire fleet and lend AP to any ship in the fleet. Uh, some special scenario rules might give the flagship additional abilities, or you may want to like target the flagship. But in terms of the basic rules, the flagship's only special ability is to lend AP to any ship in the fleet. Now to go over the rules. A fleet of three ships or less is always a legal formation. It's always fielded as a single squadron, and is always considered a flag squadron. Once you get above three ships, so four ships or more, you are required to have two or more squadrons. Now, the number of squadrons you're allowed to have is based on the bridge of your flagship. So if you look at the table over here, a bridge three, you can have one additional squadron. A uh, bridge size of five, six, or seven, you can have two squadrons. A bridge size of eight or nine, you can have three squadrons. In a bridge size of 10, you can have four squadrons. Now the size of those subordinate squadrons is limited by the size of the bridge of the squadron leader. So if the squadron leader has a bridge size of one, you can have one additional ship. It, actually one, two, or three. If it's a bridge size of four, five, or six, you can have two additional ships in the squadron, for a total of three. If it has a bridge size of seven or greater, you can have three additional ships in the squadron for a total of four ships. Now, the main benefit for being in a squadron is you can receive action points from your squadron leader. Um, as long as you're within range five of your squadron leader, they can lend you action points. Um, if you're in a universe that uses the interceptor trait for weapons, such as in Exile Stars, or Traveler, or Empire Directorate War, uh, ships can only receive or lend interceptor points within the same squadron. Unless you happen to have the weapon trait data link, and then you can lend interceptor points and defensive points to ships outside of your squadron. Now, some settings might have a specific benefit for being in a squadron. Uh, for example, uh, FTL disengagement. Um, in some um, settings, you know, a single ship 
might do the calculations to jump to light speed, and then all ships within the squadron would benefit from that calculation. So now we're going to look at different fleet sizes and seeing examples of different legal formations. Uh, for fleet size 1, 2, and 3, the formations are pretty much set in stone. Uh, the flagship here in red, so if you have a single ship, obviously you only have one ship in your squadron. Uh, two ships, obviously same squadron, pretty straightforward, as well as three ships. Again, the bridge size can be any size, as long as you have three ships or less in your fleet. Once you get to fleet size four or greater, you need to have at least one additional squadron. So here we have a couple different variations of a size four fleet. So here we have our flagship with a bridge size of three plus, so you can have one additional squadron. You see it has two subordinates, because that's for free, and then one subordinate down here in a separate squadron. A more common way of doing a size four fleet is to divvy it up into two two ship squadrons. You have the flagship squadron right here and the one subordinate squadron right here. And the subordinate ship just needs a bridge size of one or better. A more uncommon method is right here. We have a bridge size of four or better for your squadron leader. So you can have two subordinates. So your flagship squadron would be a single ship and your subordinate squadron would have three ships. One reason to do this is these two ships down here can receive two action points, one from the squadron leader and one from the flagship. So the flagship can hold back and be more of a command and control ship that does not actually get into the fight. And these ships can then take advantage of additional AP that are not, is not built into the ship being provided by the flagship and possibly the squadron leader. So depending on how, you, how your universe is set up, there might be a viable option. When you get to size five fleets, you can see the topology of fleets can become you know, pretty uh, funky at times. So here we have you know, a more standard you know, flagship squadron has two ships, whereas the subordinate squadron has one additional ship. Here, you know, kind of the inverse is true. The flagship squadron has one additional ship, while well, the subordinate squadron has uh, two additional ships. But the difference is this is a plus one, so it's like a destroyer type or a scout size ship. But this is a plus four, so it could be you no know, a large frigate or a light cruiser over here. Or you have a formation like this where the flagship is five as a bridge size of five or better, so you can have two squadrons. And each squadron you know, just has a single subordinate ship. So you have um, like a light cruiser and you know, two squadron destroyers um, doing independent commands. Or as we saw with fleet size four, we have our flagship by itself. And then a pretty maxed out squadron right here, probably like a command cruiser with uh, three subordinates doing the actual heavy lifting in the battle. Uh, this formation right here will allow each of these subordinates to receive an action point from the flagship, as well as an additional action point from the squadron leader. So you can design these ships to be, be action point poor compared to its bridge versus how many its action points it needs to use its weapons because those action points are provided by the two other ships. And in fleet size nine, we're starting to get more ossified in terms of what we can do simply because um, we, there's just so many ships, there's only so many different ways you can configure them that make sense. So over here, we have a very standardized um, setup. So each squadron has two additional ships and the flagship has a bridge size of five. So you have two additional squadrons. And each of the subordinates have a bridge size of four. So you can have two additional subordinates. So this is a very balanced, you know, you have three squadrons of three ships. 
flying formation, very um, Cylon-like. Or you can go something that's slightly more funky if you have a big enough flagship. Here we have a bridge size of eight, so we can have three subordinate squadrons. So we have these two you no know, kind of standardized squadrons. They have this one you no know, smaller squadron. Now the small squadron could actually be some pretty heavy hitting ships. It's just two of them in the squadron. A fleet size 12, again, as we get bigger and bigger fleets, the structure becomes more and more ossified. So again, no, just no pretty standard makeup. We have four squadrons with three ships apiece. The size eight bridge here for three additional squadrons. Any squadron having a um, bridge of four, they have two additional ships apiece. Alternatively, if we have the ships for it, you know, we can have like a command type cruiser with a seven bridge here, as well as over here. So we have two maxed out squadrons and then one moderate sized squadron and a naked flagship. Again, lending of action points makes this uh, ship being able to hang back and spread its action points among all eight of these uh, subordinate ships down here. So these could all have like two additional points, you know, one from the leader and one from the flagship apiece. So here we have a fleet size of 19, which is the largest possible in the game. Our flagship is size 10, so it has four additional squadrons. Each squadron has a bridge size of seven or better, so it can have three additional ships. So it's a total of 19 ships. Obviously, there's no other way to reconfigure this because everyone is maxed out. So to sum up, um, formations are mostly used as a pre-game structure. They influence your selection of forces and can help judge how many players you need to play out a scenario. However, they are important in settings that have interceptors, again, like Traveler, XL Stars, Empire Directed War. And it's always important for action point transfers. However, not every universe is set up to take advantage of action point transfers, so it really depends on the design of the ship. If a ship uses a lot of action points, but has a small bridge or aux reactor, the ability to transfer action points down the chain of command could be very important. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions, uh, please post them in the comment section down below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like to see more content like this, uh, please hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day.